everybody. In this video, I'll be talking about the notions of responsibility, a word that kept creeping up when we were talking about codes of conduct and codes of ethics. To this end herein, I'll also be referencing a few texts that I've put up in Blackboard in the course content folder in a subfolder entitled Readings on Responsibility. Here we go. Hey everyone, so at this point, what I want to do is go over notions of responsibility. This is a word that we've used this semester quite considerably already. And so what I have up here on the screen, this is from the Introduction to Engineering Ethics text by Martin and Schinzinger. And I am on page 16. And here we have a section called Meanings of Responsibility. Now, in this section, it's going to talk about definitions of responsibility. And there is stuff before it that gives an example of responsibility in the preceding pages. All of all of this, by the way, in case you didn't have the textbook, I've put up on Blackboard, at least this chapter section. But this is the focal point here. Now, this section on responsibility is channeling Hayden's article on being responsible from 1978. I've put that up on Blackboard too, so it's here. And this one is actually channeling a piece by Nicholas Haynes from the 1950s called Responsibility and Accountability. So we'll be taking a look at these. But I'm going to start with the, the main text for the course. And what we see here are four notions of responsibility. Now I'm going to distinguish that from some of the stuff that Hayden says, because Hayden actually gives a couple more defin definitions of responsibility or features of responsibility that I want to go into as well. His piece is a little bit more technical in ethics and Haynes' piece is, is even more technical and involves a little bit more historical knowledge of moralists of the 19th century, with, with which you'll probably not be familiar. But let's, let's start with this. So, responsibility. What are the four basic ways that somebody can be responsible for, some, for something? So when we say someone is responsible, so if I look at someone and I say, hey, Carol's responsible, what does that mean? Does it mean they have a good sense of what they're supposed to do? Does it mean that they take ownership of things when they make a mistake? What does it mean to be responsible? And what we have here are basically four definitions, and these can all be used interchangeably. When we say that a corporation is responsible for something, so BP is responsible for the oil spill, what do we mean when we say that? Or they're being responsible for the oil spill, or we say an, an individual is responsible for some kind of disaster. So here are the senses in which we can talk about responsibility, of which the text is going to outline four for us, and let's consider them. The first sense of responsibility, which your text calls it, it's the core idea. So when we're talking about responsibility, this is probably what we mean, but it's not reducible to what we mean. And that is the responsibility as a sense of obligation. So obligation is another way of saying duty. So this is very much related to a deontological conception of responsibility. So what does it mean to be responsible? Responsibilities are obligations. They are duties that we have. So like when we were talking about Ross earlier with his various duties like beneficence and non-maleficence, or as we were describing them as duties, we could also say they're something that everybody is responsible for individually. We could also say that about Kant's categorical imperative regardless of what formulation we're looking at everybody is responsible to act only on that subjective maximum they at the same time well that it should become a universal law everybody is to be responsible for never treating someone merely as a means everybody is to be responsible as a legislating member in a kingdom of ends now it continues what what does that obligation or duty look like well these are types of actions that are morally mandatory. You must do them. Now, that mustness or that obligation also means that there is a possibility to be deficient. If you have if you're responsible, you have an obligation, you are supposed to do it, but that means that you can through either bad will or neglect not do what you're supposed to do. And so that's what your responsibility is. The the text continues. Some obligations are incumbent on each of us such as to be honest, fair, and decent. I think it depends on what discipline you find yourself in. I think if you're in engineering, that is the case, that we are to be honest, fair, and decent. These are obligations that we have, well, to whom? Really, to ourselves and to each other and to society. So those are the kind of prima facie obligations that W.D. Ross talked about, the obligations that everybody has, what Kant would call categorical imperatives as well, I think would be those kinds of obligations that are universal, they apply to everyone. However, 
Some other obligations are role responsibilities. So some obligations are not, I don't, I don't want to say they're hypothetical imperatives, like Kant would say, but they are situational obligations. So if you find yourself being a parent, then you're responsible for your child. I can think of other situations where if you found a child somewhere aimlessly walking around with, and couldn't find their parents, I think then we have an obligation to other people's children. Then in, in instances like that, if we saw somebody being cruel to someone else, that we have an obligation to step in. Maybe I'm mistaken there. But nevertheless, a parent's responsibility is to the parent, but that's a situation, whether it be voluntary or not. So someone might have been planning to have children. If you did, you're responsible for your children. You might not have been planning to have children. Nevertheless, you're responsible for your children and you have obligations to them. Further, if you find yourself in a career situation, you become an engineer, you're responsible to your employer, your employees, and clients, and even as we've established from the codes of ethics, the general public. Just like me, as a professor, my responsibility is primarily, in my view, to all of you. It's also to the university and its administration and my superiors and so forth, but I think my primary obligation is to you. But this is a situational obligation. Not everybody has the same kind of responsibility to students or to the university, at least in that direct way. There might be something indirect we could say through taxation or government grants or something like that. But what does this entail for engineering? Thus, a safety engineer might have responsibilities for making regular inspections at a building site, or an operations engineer might have responsibilities for identifying potential benefits and risks of one system as compared with another. But that's their situational responsibility. It's something that comes into play, you could say, really only if one finds themselves in that situation. So in that sense, they're situational. Like, just like if you take any role at that moment, then you become responsible. This is the main view of responsibility, a sense of obligation. Now, what will happen sometimes is when we're talking about responsibility, this one will get conflated that is, it'll get mixed up with the other views of responsibility, but sometimes the other views of responsibility are also incorporated into it as well. So we've covered the main one. Let's take a look at the next one. The next definition uh, or view, what we could call it a mode of responsibility, is accountability. And sometimes you'll hear those words used interchangeably too. So to be accountable to something is to be responsible for it. This one is in a moral sense. What do we mean by accountability is moral accountability. So, <laughs> but what does that entail? This means when someone is accountable, they have, as it says, the general capacities for moral agency. So being responsible here is not so much about the obligations, but it's about the capability or capacity to act and understand for moral reasons. So here, responsibility is not so much situational, like you find yourself in a certain circumstance and now I'm responsible for the duties or obligations that I have in this moment. This kind of responsibility is more dispositional. That is, you're disposed to do so, you're, you're disposed to do something or predisposed to do something. You're ready to respond to something in a particular kind of way. And that means when we're talking about capacity, like can you deal with the moral features of this? If you had to give an answer about something, could you do it? And that's the notion of accountability. So here accountability is often tied, as you'll see in the other pieces too, to a notion of explicability. I think that's going to be, I'm going to move here to the Haynes piece, and this is on 142 in the PDF, it's on page 3, where he defines, and then, again, this is a piece from the 50s, he, he defines accountability as explicability. Explicability is not a word we use very often, but it means to, for something to be explicable is to be able to talk about it, to explain it. We say something, it's it's inexplicable if there's no way we could describe it. So sometimes you're probably more familiar with that word. Like, it's just inexplicable. Like, there are no words to describe it. <laughs> really, that would be ineffable. But here, we, we really can't explain what's going on. And so the uh, accountability would be the ability to explain things if it comes to it. And one is unaccountable, not in the sense of they have nothing to do with the responsibility, but if we find someone is incapable of accountability, that means they're unable to explain or talk about it, like because they lack the capacity to do so. So I'm going to read a little bit of what Payne says here on this, and then we'll go back to the main text. He says in, I'm going to look at this paragraph, uh, and there's some, some of this is antiquated because this is a piece that's about 70 years old, but I think this will be helpful to look at the notion of accountability. Haynes says, in ordinary speech, an act is accountable not only when it's liable, 
that is something that that should be done or there's a there's a cause for something to go wrong liability is another sense of responsibility as well although the textbook is going to change the words that it uses there but he says it's not just a matter of liability it's also a matter of when it's explicable if now from my window i see a motorist fling over the wheel so that his car crashes into another i may certainly speak as the of the driver as accountable for his act and expect to see him approached by the police or even face trial for manslaughter. So you look outside and you see somebody crash into somebody else and let's say the, 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 someone else is injured as a result and then maybe you can see that he doesn't really say this in this uh, context but that, imagine you see the other person drive away. You would expect the police to end up finding this person going like what were you doing? And that his ability to respond, oh I didn't see him there that right there, that's the notion of accountability. How do you respond to what you're doing? So when people are charged with crimes, for example, I'm not just saying, you know, guilty, not guilty, no contest, but how people explain or reason what they did is a kind of responsibility as well, their ability to do so. He continues, that's Haynes, I may however speak of his act as accountable in two other ways, both of which are modes not of not liability, but of uh, be, that is being responsible in the sense of you did something wrong but of explanation he says roughly and inaccurately i may describe those two ways as explanation by causes of and reasons for or better still non-rational explanation and rational explanation a brainstorm will do as an instance of non-rational explanation a split second decision to avoid a child crossing the road in front of him or even a carefully planned attempt to murder the driver of the other car will do as rational explanations it might seem irrational but here's what he's saying part of accountability is getting the reasons for or the causes for something so when you sometimes when we see an event we just see the stuff happening and we don't know what's going on in the background so if we looked out let's say like i've got my window behind me i heard a car crash and i look outside and i see somebody else it looks like a car crash and then someone else is running you know drives away and my immediate conclusion might be i can't believe that someone did this someone crashed in someone else and it was a hit and run and he says part of accountability would be oh you didn't know that the reason why they crashed was maybe they were trying to avoid a child that was out in the middle of the street or maybe they were actually trying to kill the other person <laughs> like they saw that person they're like i'm ready to kill you and they drive into them both of those would still be accounts or explanations another one another example might be i think in this situation like if i see a car crash and then someone drives off like well you know they're trying to get away maybe they didn't have insurance that might be part of the account but also maybe someone was in the car and had to go to the hospital like and they couldn't stay there in that moment because someone else in the car was in danger of dying and they had to get to the hospital and that meant if that the hit and run had to happen there might still be legal consequences for that but that ends up being an explanation as to why so sometimes like i said we just see things happen accountability is the ex is explaining why something happened so he, he, so taking taking responsibility in this sense is being able to explain why did you do what you did and that's why sometimes like in personal relationships maybe you said you were going wash the dishes and you didn't and your partner gets mad at you like why didn't you wash the dishes and maybe you just had like the maybe you had the worst day at work ever and you're like look i know i didn't get it done but i had a really rough day that's you, you didn't follow the obligation uh, in the situation that you promised I was going to do the dishes but nevertheless offering an account as to why whether it's legitimate or not maybe you didn't have a bad day at work and you're just telling a lie that's still a kind of responsibility in terms of giving an account now I think where accountability is genuinely responsibilities we're when we're telling the truth about it like I, I really did have a rough day and that's why I didn't do it because I, I just it didn't cross my mind that's still a kind of accountability so let's go back now to this piece that, that is your main textbook so what else do we say here so accountability involves both the capacity for explanation and then the actual activity of explanation or explicability when it comes to it often if nothing goes wrong there's nothing to explain uh, and you know this if you're not in trouble you have to do far less explanations than if you find yourself in trouble why did you do what you did so when it comes to taking an account and that's why even sometimes when we're talking about explanation sometimes we're talking about our, our narratives we're talking about accounts that's what I mean by accountability here is the ability to offer an explanation offer an account of what happened that's accountability let's take a look wrongdoing when we talk about somebody doing something that they shouldn't have done takes two primary forms voluntary wrongdoings and an un unintentional negligence voluntary wrongdoing occurs when we knew we were doing wrong and we're not coerced 
Sometimes it's caused by recklessness, that is flagrant disregard of known risks and responsibilities. Other times it's a result of weakness or will, whereby we give into a temptation or fail to try hard enough. In contrast, unintentional negligence occurs when we unintentionally fail to exercise due care in meeting responsibilities. We might not have known what we were doing, but we should have known. Shoddy engineering because of sheer incompetence usually falls into this category. So here it mentions we have aspects of voluntary and involuntary. Wrongdoing can still be unintentional. Now remember in some aspects of deontology the intent goes a lot into the notion of culpability. Like it's more like which is which is worse? Is it wrong to accidentally do something? Or is it more wrong to intentionally do something? And as I've said before, the way our legal system works is we often have various degrees of crimes based on in the notion of intent. Which is worse, first degree murder or manslaughter? Well, the penalties for first degree murder are significantly more punitive and severe than the penalties for manslaughter. But the end result is the same. Somebody killed somebody else. But we penalize the the accidental kind far less. Now, sometimes somebody might, or like a, like it's something with engineering, somebody might do something because of being shoddy. They weren't as thorough as they ought to have been, and people sometimes people die as a result of shoddiness. I think this is the case with the Challenger explosion in many respects. So as terrible as that is, and we can hold people accountable and responsible there, that's still, in some sense, perhaps better than someone working on the Challenger mission was attempting to murder the crew. That would be malevolent and that would be considered worse. But this is where this comes into play. Sometimes it's acts of, we could say, I know it doesn't use this in this paragraph, but I would say we could distinguish between commission, committing something, and omission, neglecting to do something. Both of those can still be an activity, whether you're actively doing something or inactively doing something and something terrible happens as a result. That's the second component of the notion of responsibility, being able to give an account. The third notion of responsibility is conscientiousness. What does it mean to be conscientious? Well, an engineer accepts their obligations and are conscientious in meeting them. They diligently try to do the right thing, and they largely succeed in doing so even under difficult circumstances. In this sense, being responsible is a virtue, it, not a duty, an excellence of character. Of course, no one is perfect, and we might be conscientious in some areas of life, such as our work, and less conscientious in other areas, such as raising a child. Maybe we're really good at our job, but we're not as attentive to our children as we might be. So some people can be very conscientious in some areas uh, and not in others. So to review what we have so far, the first notion of responsibility is a notion of duty or obligation. Here's what I'm supposed to do. Okay, in this specific circumstance. Now, some specific circumstances are just being a human, but it's not a virtue, it's a duty. Okay, that it's something that you must do. The second notion of responsibility is accountability. Like, are you able to explain your actions? And it's not just the explaining. Do you have the capacity to explain your actions? Maybe you don't want somebody to be on the PR side of things if they're incapable of making an explanation or unable of talking about things effectively. So on the second aspect, being an effective communicator is important. Here, this is a virtue, and it's a matter of commitment to doing the right thing in a particular situation. So that's another kind of responsibility. So here, the first one, obligatory. The second one, explicability. The third one here, volitional. That is, it has to do with the will. Like, are you going to do whatever it takes to do the right thing? That's responsibility as well. Even if it doesn't translate into specific, I need to do this exact thing. Sometimes it's inexact. But this is a character attribute, trying to do the best thing that we can, not out of a sense of duty, but out of a sense of virtue or excellence. So I want you to see how that, here, that sounds like Aristotle and Conxi, to be this person is to, like, will you pursue virtue for the sake of virtue itself? Will you be, as Conxi would say, will you be a Junsi, a, a gentleman, or the, the, the son of someone who is noble? Will you, will you do it? And so this one's more about personality or character than it is about actual acts. And then finally, the last sense of responsibility is what is often called, in, in the other literature, it's often referred to as liability. But the textbook distinguishes it, and I think, I think this is actually a helpful distinction, rather than talking about liability as you know, when we say responsible for something like, if I make this sound, 
who's responsible for the sound? I am. Now that has nothing to do with obligation. Even if I don't say that I did it, I still did, so it has nothing to do with me explaining it. Neither does it have anything to do with conscientiousness, me making the sound. I'm not doing the right thing. Here I'm responsible in a sense of agency or liability. Now often we use liable in a legal sense where we're talking about, you know, do you have liability insurance? Uh, you know, if you crash your car, who's responsible for paying the bill? This language comes up sometimes in real estate. We can talk about, you know, limited liability in right? corporations and things like that. Or you're, you're liable for damages to the property in your lease or things like that. That is, you're responsible for it. If what? Well, here, responsible in the sense of you did good or you did bad. That is, blameworthiness and praiseworthiness. So I'm going to read this paragraph and then I'm going to unpack it a bit. In context where it's clear that accountability for wrongdoing is an issue, responsible becomes a synonym for blameworthy. In context where it's clear that the right conduct is at issue, responsible is a synonym for praiseworthy. So that means, let's say you turn in a paper that's, that's terrible. Like it's awful. And I, I look at you and I say, how could you do this? Who's responsible for turning in the bad paper? You are. If you make a great paper, who's responsible for that? You are. So if you do, basically, if you do bad, you're responsible in that sense for the bad thing that you did. And if you do good, you're responsible for the good thing that you did. But here we're talking not about simply causality, but there's notions of goodness and badness attached to it in responsibility. So yeah, sure, we could say it's good that someone's conscientious is a virtue. It's good that someone follows their obligations. It's good that someone is able to account. But here we're talking about good and bad. So if someone did this good thing, they're responsible. Someone did this bad thing, they're irresponsible. We, could, we might use the language and say someone's irresponsible, they're not responsible, but really what we're saying is they're worthy of blame for this. They're worthy of, I think Haynes will use this old term, approbation, which means to tell somebody, like to, to be appropriative is to tell somebody, yeah, you're doing bad. It's related to the word probation. Basically, you're on, you should be on probation because that's how bad you're being, is what you're saying when you use that language. So, let's say when there's an accident that occurs, let's go with like an oil spill or something, obligations. You could say from the get-go, like oil companies have a responsibility to be more careful. Uh, they, they have a special duty, not, I mean, not other, co other corporations don't have the same, like the University of South Carolina Aiken does not have a responsibility to monitor BP's oil rigs. That's not in their purview, but BP does. So there, that's they're, they would be responsible from the get-go. In terms of accountability, are they saying no? We like we didn't do it. Like here, I think of Chernobyl again, where the Soviet Union, when there was a nuclear meltdown, literally the Soviet Union, were like, we're all fine, everything's fine. There's nothing to look at, nothing to see here. Not good on the accountability end. But are people coming out and saying, hey, we made a mistake, this shouldn't have happened. Uh, let's be accountable about it. Let me explain what's going on, and here's what we're going to do. That's the notion of accountability. Conscientiousness. Maintaining, even if you did make a mistake, we're, we're going to try and do the right thing. We're going to try and fix this. We're going to do everything in our power to do it. Uh, we, we have an oil spill. We're going to clean it up. We're going to make restitution for mistakes that we've made. And then blameworthiness or praiseworthy. Yep, we're the ones that did it. It shouldn't have happened, but we take full responsibility for it. There's that sense of responsibility. When someone says that taking responsibility, this is another aspect of that. We'll take responsibility for it. Yes, it's us, but you can, you, as you can see here, I could say like for an oil spill, a particular company could be responsible for it and be responsible for it in all these four different senses. Or they might be responsible in some senses, but not others. And therefore, when we say that, so, that a corporation or an individual is responsible for something, sometimes we have to figure out, you know, okay, is it, did they get the whole bundle? Or is it just elements of it? Now, what I want to do here, this is again in your text, and there are other kinds of responsibility that goes into that I want to that I want to look at here, and then I want to transition to Hayden's on being responsible and talk about that a little bit. So I'll read this here and then we'll move forward. The preceding meanings all concern moral responsibility in particular as it bears to, on professional responsibility. Moral responsibility is distinguishable from causal job and legal responsibility. Causal responsibility consists in simply being the cause of some event. What's responsible for the ground being wet today? Well, it's the it's the rain that happened yesterday. But there, I'm not, yeah, I could say that the rain is responsible for the ground being wet, or the sun is responsible for the light coming in behind me. But here, I'm not making any kind of moral statements about responsibility. Job responsibility, a little bit further down, 
Job responsibility consists of one's assigned tasks at the place of employment. So we can say there, this is not really a moral responsibility. It could be if someone's trying to get you to do something out of your job description. But like, let's say you get a job somewhere and they say, one of, th one of your responsibilities will be to lift, pound, lift uh, boxes that are up to 50 pounds. This sometimes happens with workers that are more elderly. Like, okay, you have to lift up to 50 pounds. Cool. But all of a sudden, maybe a truck comes in and there's a box on it that weighs 200 pounds. That's not in your job description. All right, it's specifically stated 50 pounds or less, or fewer. So that's a notion of job responsibility. Now, if someone's trying to get you to do it, no, you're going to lift that no matter what. Now these are moral problems. But job responsibilities are simply the things that you're supposed to do. Not necessarily in a moral sense, but in a, in a sense of... This is the job that I have. And finally, legal responsibility is to do whatever the law requires. So what would that mean in terms of legal responsibility? So <laughs> legal responsibility. Uh, now, originally, in about a month, we had a tax deadline. Uh, that is going to move now to July 15th. In spite of it moving, if you have taxable income, you are legally responsible to pay your taxes. It's not necessarily a moral thing to do. All right, like I, I have a sense of duty, I've done the right thing, I've paid my taxes. Legally, that's what's required of you. You might be legally required to stop at stop signs or stop at red lights. And that's a legal responsibility, but that's not really something, maybe you could say in a moral sense, because when you're driving, it involves the health and safety of others. But um, just following the law, you can be responsible in that sense, but that doesn't make it morally praiseworthy. I don't think every time someone stops at a stop sign, we necessarily need to give them, you know, a, like a good job sticker. Uh, nor necessarily if someone's, you know, doing a California stop at a stop sign, do they need to get a ticket for it necessarily either, especially if there's no one else around. Granted, that's another notion of responsibility, I hope. But basically just following the law, doing the things that you're supposed to do, that's legal responsibility. It's not necessarily moral. Now, on the other hand, a neglect of those things might be criminal, potentially also immoral in that sense. But that's a different kind of responsibility. I want you to really focus on those those four that we looked at a moment ago. Now, furthermore, if we look at Hayden's notion of responsibility, which actually your textbook references this on the bottom of page 16. It's like, oh, this notion of obligation. Here's the piece, and here's the actual piece. So here, this one's a little, a little, little less antiquated because I think it's from the 70s, but I want to look at what he defines as the elements of responsibility. So first of all, in the piece, page 48, on the PDF itself, it's actually the fourth page, this piece starts off with Hayden saying that, yeah, there's a lot of different definitions of responsibility, so let's talk about it. So the first element is this, taking seriously the responsibilities of roles. Now, this is exactly what we were talking about with obligations before. So Hayden says, and here he's quoting part, a responsible person in this view, behaving responsibly, not irresponsibly, require for their elucidation a reference to role responsibility. A responsible person is one who is disposed to take his duties seriously, to think about them, and to make serious efforts to fulfill them. To behave responsibly is to behave as a man would who took his duties in the serious way. You'll notice here it uses the word duty. I think here also, since it mentions the serious efforts, that also kind of sounds like conscientiousness is embedded into this version as well. And they kind of go together, but here the focus is on the actual duties or responsibilities themselves, and not merely the attitude, but the situatedness of the obligations. That's the first element. The second element is the conforming to role expectations. So we'll look at this paragraph. In assessing whether a person takes his responsibility seriously, someone, I shall call him we'll call Mr. X, might suppose that a person's responsibilities are exhaustively given by his major social and occupational roles. Behavior which falls outside the scope of these roles, as commonly understood, Mr. X will at best consider irrelevant in the assessment of the person's virtue responsibility. Then Mr. X will call the person responsible if and only if Mr. X judges him to be taking seriously, there's that phrase again, taking seriously, the responsibilities pertaining to the central and socially approved roles which he occupies. Moreover, if Mr. X takes this view of a person's responsibilities, he may also take the context of the responsibilities to be given by generally held expectations as to behavior within the role. And if those expectations seem clear-cut and undemanding, Mr. X may assume that a person is not taking his responsibilities seriously unless his overt behavior does conform to expectations. He will not then consider the way that the agent sees his situation and will not leave 
room for the possibility that the agent might, in all seriousness, interpret his responsibilities in a way that ran counter to his expectations. So think about this when you see often what parents will do is they will judge other parents. I think sometimes that's entirely appropriate. Like that's the way I think about other parents that don't vaccinate their children. Like uh, you're irresponsible parents. You have a, it's not just the duty or the obligation itself, but like, are you, like if you're a parent, there, there are things about parents that might not seem like obligatory. They're not written into law per se. So there's not a hard legal norm there, but there are things that are just like, if you find yourself on a roll, these are the things that you're supposed to do. If you're a parent, that means taking care of your kids, and that means specific things, like make sure they get to school, make sure they get fed. Now, if you have problems fulfilling those things, of course, you know, be because of, not because of neglect, but because of a hardship, that's one thing. Or say you're in a romantic relationship with somebody, there are, like, are you doing the things that you're supposed to be doing there? That's, that would be a notion of role expert, like, are you doing the, are you doing at least the basics of the things that are at least taken as standard that you're supposed to do? So it's not, here it's not so much the assent to the obligations, here it's the performativity or the performance of one towards those responsibilities. If you find yourself, if you're an athlete, uh, you know, are you, are you, uh, you, yeah, sure, you have the obligations to your team uh, or to your school or to your coach or to your teammates or whatever, but are, I mean, if you're an athlete, are you keeping yourself healthy? Are you just saying, no, 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 I don't need to practice. It'll, it'll work out just fine. That's an aspect of responsibility here for Hayden as well. Third element, taking seriously obligations in general. What does that mean? Taking the notion of obligations in general means you, you're not going to sign up for obligations unless you're taking them seriously. This would include things like Kant said about, you know, don't make promises capriciously. So you don't want to go around saying, yeah, sure, I'll, yeah, I'll do that, I'll be fine. Don't say you're going to do something unless you're going to do it. Not simply in the roles that you've already signed up for, but taking the notion of obligation very seriously. You know, this, this is the, I think, third time now. In each one of these elements that Hayden's described, we're talking, he uses the phrase taking seriously. That means the notion that the authors of your text called conscientiousness is embedded into all these other elements as well. But then we come to the fourth element, which is itself being conscientious. So what does that mean? Well, that means that in this particular interpretation of responsibility, it goes well insofar as it goes, but there's something else that's needed, which is the undertaking of responsibility. So that's what it means to be conscientious is to, and you see this here, you notice it's, it's italicized, is the undertaking of responsibility, so long as it does not conflict with prior responsibility. So someone can be entirely responsible for doing all the things that they've signed up for. So let's say they're an athlete, they practice, they maintain good health, they do all the things that they're supposed to do for the team, but then they don't do it. They come home and they don't do anything else. They don't help people out around the house. They, maybe they don't pay their taxes. Neither do they sign up to do anything. So they don't volunteer helping anyone in any kind of circumstance whatsoever. So in this case, they might be responsible for the obligations that they find themselves situationally in, but they don't volunteer or sign up for new obligations. That's a lack of conscientiousness in Hayden's view here. The fifth aspect here is something that sounds like something out of a little bit of utilitarianism. It's not, we, we talked when we were looking at the stuff in the text about intentionality. Here, look at this. The fifth element is having regard for consequences. So this is part of Hayden's elements of responsibility. So this involves trying to think through one's proposals to consider their less obvious effects, to take account of questions in the form of, you know, in itself, what is proposed is no doubt all very well, but what happens if we if this happens? So looking at hypothetical situations that will result from what you're doing, that's also responsibility. Not just thinking like, I want this, this is the thing I want to do. If we do this thing, what are some possibilities that could happen? So when it comes to looking at, say, building in engineering, like let's say everything goes successfully, everything's great. Well, what do we do in the situation if there's an oil spill, if a bridge collapses? If we find ourselves in the situation, what do we do? Do we just say, you know, tough luck? Or what are you going to do about it? that's the fifth element of responsibilities that having regard for consequences now this sixth one is very kantian you'll notice the sixth element that you see in front of you is being autonomous now, autonomous is not a word that we use very often but what does it mean to be autonomous well literally auto is a, is a greek prefix which means self like an automobile you, you, it's not powered by horses nomos is a word that means law like astronomy means, means law of the stars so what does it mean to be autonomous well this is very important for kant for kant all rational beings are autonomous beings 
because we self-legislate. We make laws for ourselves. Yes, we follow the laws of our household or of our societies, of our culture, of our states, of our nations, but to be autonomous means we also impose laws upon ourselves. We self-legislate and we self-regulate. And that's what we ought to do. So this is a little bit of a deontological take. So you'll notice Hayden says here that the condition of autonomy is included in many conceptions of responsibility, though not all. Here, for lack of space, I shall have to assume a tolerably clear understanding of autonomy as a desirable personal attribute. The autonomous man, again, a little older piece, autonomous human, it would generally be agreed, forms his own judgments. It is often added that he forms them rationally and sometimes that he also acts on them. The requirement in any case goes beyond that of it goes beyond conscientiousness for in a commonplace though non-Kantian conception of non-conscientiousness the notion of a conscientious but heteronymous follower of some conventional code is quite consistent. So in order to be autonomous we don't want to be heteronymous. So what is heteronymous? That is well someone else told me to do it because literally that means the law of others. So we just do whatever someone else says. Like, well, they told me to do it. I have no responsibility. Autonomy is where we take our own responsibility and don't simply rely on the orders of others. Now, sometimes you might find yourself in a, in a military situation where we say, hey, I was just following orders. But sometimes we also find, uh, and that can bring up, uh, you know, CMJ and elements of court martial and things like that. We also find sometimes when people are given orders that they think are illegal orders, Sometimes we call these people conscientious objectors. It might be better to call them autonomous objectors. They're self-legislating. I cannot do this. I will take responsibility in this moment. I'm not going to do it. That's autonomy. Think for yourself. I know we say that sometimes, and often thinking for yourself means thinking someone else's ideas, even there. But think for yourself, not in the sense of being a capriciously open-minded, whatever that means, but thinking for oneself and saying, I'm going to make my own judgments. Yes, I find myself in situations where I'm supposed to do what others tell me, but I'm also going to do it for myself. That's a notion of autonomy. And then this last element here is what we've already kind of seen, the diversity of the usage. I mean, we talked about responsibility as accountability. We talked about responsibility as liability. We talked about responsibility as conscientiousness. We talked about responsibility as praiseworthiness, blameworthiness, omission, commission, voluntary, involuntary. Here, he goes on more, like it involves conscientiousness, regard for consequences, autonomy. That's something he adds that your text does not. How does all this fit together? Well, this is part of the problem when it comes to responsibility, that I just want you to recognize that there are all these notions of responsibility. They're not necessarily equivalent, although they can be bundled together. So when you're looking at incidents and we're talking about who's the responsible party or who is responsible for this oil spill or who's responsible for this thing, which sense are you using it? Are you using responsibility in the sense of obligation? Are you using responsibility in the sense of conscientiousness? Are you using responsibility in the sense of, you know, how do they how do they talk about it? Maybe they maybe they knew their duties very well, but they didn't explain what they were doing. In which case they were responsible in an obligatory sense, but irresponsible in the explicability sense. So that's what I'm thinking about.